Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Nicole Magruder. I'm the executive director for Community Hero Action Group. Our mission is closing the gap in wealth and health disparities within the Black community. Um, welcome to today's last form of the first day of the Black Health Matters Conference 2022 Disrupt and Build Up. Um, I'm pleased to have a, a wonderful um, panel of um, esteemed guests here tonight. And our discussion will be led by Mr. Charles Ellison himself. Um, and uh, the title of tonight's forum is the State of Health Policy in Pennsylvania. Charles Ellison is an award-winning thought leader, political strategist, commentator, and advocacy expert with nearly two decades of applied expertise in the arena of politics, public policy, campaigns, and elections, crisis management, and emerging digital media strategy. And I think what he's most proud of is probably that he was the keynote speaker in last year's conference of our um, Black Health Matters conference. Um, so we're, we're happy to uh, have him back again. Um, so Supporting Community Hero and this year's conference. So without further ado, I will hand this over to Mr. Charles Ellison. Thank you so much. Nicole, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time. I appreciate everyone's patience this evening. I'm Charles Ellison. Uh, you know me daily on WURD, uh, host the Daily Public Affairs Program, Reality Check, and also managing editor for EcoWord, uh, the, our EcoWord Environmental Justice um, Journalism Project. So this um, has some really deep uh, personal and professional interest for me, this topic of uh, health, health matters, health quality in Pennsylvania, um, especially as it intersects with a lot of environmental issues, which we're going to touch on uh, a little bit this evening uh, here in Pennsylvania and beyond. So we've got uh, a great panel, great roundtable of, of, of expert practitioners, uh, policymakers, uh, people who are very uh, extremely, uh, extremely uh, informed uh, in this in this issue of the state or the condition of our public health in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're going to have a conversation very momentarily with uh, the Pennsylvania Physician General, Dr. Denise Johnson. She's coming up next and a little bit later on, we're going to talk with Pennsylvania State Representative Donna Bullock, representing the 195th District. Representative Stephen Kinsey as well uh, is going to be joining us, her colleague in the 201st District. Uh, also State Representative Gina Curry, of the 184, 164 district, excuse me. Carol Hill Evans is in the 95th district. Clay Jacobs is the executive director of the Alzheimer's Association. And Corinne O'Connell uh, is the executive director of Habitat for Humanity Philadelphia, along with Ajay, uh, Ajay Nair, Nair, excuse me, uh, who's the president of Arcadia University. Um, so uh, essentially what we're gonna do, we're gonna present our panelists as uh, a lineup of speakers uh, folks who will talk about uh, what they're seeing in the health space uh, and also ideas that they have, innovative ideas that they have for improving Black health conditions, Black health in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, particularly as uh, many of them, especially our, pol especially our policymakers, um, are dealing or have to directly deal with uh, health distress constituencies regularly. So we'll, um, we're going to go ahead first with opening remarks from Dr. Janice Johnson, if she's there right now. She is the Physician General for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. For more information, you wanna to go to health.pa.gov. Um, Physician General, can you, are you here? I am right here. Are you able to hear me okay? Uh, yes, I am. All right, excellent, excellent. So uh, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate this. Once again, for more information, uh, folks, listeners, people in the audience wanna to continue to go to Black Health Matters, PA. Mm -hmm dot org so um if you could physician general um if you could talk with us about current policy initiatives that you're currently rolling out or implementing or you're involved in that are addressing a lot of these deep health inequities uh health disparities that we're seeing in the black community especially in pennsylvania great well thank you so much um i am very happy to be here uh, nicole thank you for inviting me and representative bullock Kinsey, Hill Evans, and Curry, um, thank you so much for your interest in, in these topics and for your advocacy. And it's really great to see this focus uh, during, uh, we've just passed uh, Black Maternal Health Week and this is Minority Health Month. And so really glad to be able to participate uh, in, in this discussion. So I think um, all of you are here and participating because you know that uh, 
we're in an inequitable society and uh, our care delivery systems and organizational structures do unfairly benefit some and disadvantage others. And true health equity is achieved when every single person has the opportunity to attain his or her, her full health potential and isn't disadvantaged because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. At the Department of Health, we are putting a high priority on health equity. And uh, during the pandemic, um, I think uh, all of uh, us have um, really realized that uh, we know that uh, pandemics can really impact all populations. But those who have been previously disadvantaged fear worse uh, during these uh, these crises. And that's nothing different than we saw with COVID-19. And so we're really putting a focus on health equity to make sure that that health equity frames everything that we do at the department. One of the things that we have um, established um, several years ago is our Office of Health Equity. And our Office of Health Equity is leading the charge um, for health uh, equity as a priority for us. So this is total health equity. So it's not just racial equity, um, but it includes geography, income, social standing, disability, sexual orientation, and more. The Office of Health Equity has uh, led the efforts to engage all of our Commonwealth agencies under the umbrella of the Pennsylvania Interagency Health Equity Team. During the COVID-19 response, the office also rallied partners, external partners together to form the COVID-19 health equity response team to address inequities. And this team now is comprised of hundreds of stakeholders. But one of our more recent um, establishments that um, is really uh, exciting and I think um, really game changing is our community health organizer program and the regional health equity teams. Mm -hmm. And so the function of these community health organizers um, kind of lends on some of the lessons that we learned during the pandemic. During the pandemic, we learned that uh, the Department of Health or the government was not necessarily the right messenger for all populations, um, that centrally, we did not have the uh, relationships with individuals in communities, and it was really hard to uh, have individuals access the healthcare that they need from a central standpoint. And so we really needed to engage local stakeholders, many of them who have already been doing the work um, to be able to reach people in, within communities. Our community health organizers um, are individuals from within the communities who are working to liaison with the public health system, but also with the community, organi the community organizations uh, to make sure that we can address social determinants of health within communities and utilize those stakeholders to improve the health at a local grassroots level as opposed to centrally as we've been doing. So I'm glad that all of you are interested um, in uh, health equity and much of the work that you're doing. We need to really increase our collaborations. Um, and I think as we go forward, um, with the Department of Health, that's what we're really going to be focused on doing, working with our partners and engaging them so that we can address health equity on a local level. But thank you very much for having me. A, a real quick, Physician General, before we go on to our next uh, panelist, uh, I'm just wondering um, the extent of those increased collaborations. Um, do you have a sense of like more specifically what they would look like? Um, and and do, they, do they differ according to region? Uh, for example, you know, Pennsylvania is a large state. And so, you know, what might work in Philadelphia might be a little different, right? In Harrisburg or Pittsburgh, for example. I'm just curious before we let you go. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And so um, that's why we are really recruiting community health organizers from within the community. Many of them already have relationships and know the landscapes. We also, as we're working with these regional accountable um, health uh, groups, um, they are addressing the local needs as identified by the 
individuals who live in those communities. So mm -hmm. it's not centrally the Department of Health um, deciding then that this is what needs to be done um, in all of our regions, but regionally determined um, health needs. And we're working to engage stakeholders, um, empower, and in some cases, resource stakeholders to address those locally self-identified issues. All right, thank you. Uh, we've been talking with Physician General for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Denise Johnson. So for more there, go to health.pa.gov. Uh, she is also on social media, I noticed, PA Physgen on Twitter. Uh, for more information there, uh, she was actually formerly Chief Medical Officer at the Meadville Medical Center, and she is a board, board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, and uh, there's a former commissioner for the Governor's Commission for Women uh, here with our Black Health Matters PA conversation on health inequities. Uh, we'll go to our next panelist uh, who's joining us here. I've talked with her many times before about this issue and others. Uh, State Representative Donna Bullock, uh, Pennsylvania State Representative Donna Bullock, that is representing the 195th Legislative District. Uh, for more information, there on Donna Bullock, uh, you can go to pahouse.com slash Bullock. And I think we have her now. Yes. Representative, how are you doing? Doing well. Good evening, Charles. All right. All right. Good evening. So this is something that you've worked on. I, I, I mean, a lot of your work is at the intersection of health and also um, you place a big emphasis on environmental issues, environmental justice issues as well. And we say an intersection, but I mean, a lot of these issues really overlap quite a bit. Uh, so talk about um, some of the policies, some of the legislation that you're working on. I know one you've been uh, pushing heavily for an Office of Health Equity. Or, well, talk with us about where we are with the Office of Health Equity, um, if that's in place, when that would be in place or fully functional. Right. Thank you. Um, so first, I want to just thank uh, Dr. Johnson for her remarks. Um, and just to clarify that the Office of Health Equity actually does exist and has been in existence mm -hmm. since 2007. Mm -hmm. But it exists right now, um, you know, under an executive order from the governor. And so right. I have introduced legislation in partnership with the Department of Health to codify that Office of Health, um, Health Office of Health Equity, because we believe that it is important. Um, the Office of Health Equity had been working on these issues since 2007 and in 2018 released a report on the annual um, state of health equity um, here in, Com in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And in that report, one of the recommendations was to codify this office. Um, and maybe they didn't realize it. We didn't know. Nobody knew in 2018, 2019 that we would be facing a pandemic in 2020 um, and 2021 and 22. And so now the work of the Office of Health Equity has become so much more important. They had already laid the foundation about the social determinants of health and all of the issues um, that communities that don't have access to health insurance or community health centers that they were already facing prior to a pandemic, um, that there were these inequities already existing that would and, and had been obstacles and barriers to vaccine vaccine distribution and testing during a pandemic um, and helped us really dig a little deeper into all of these other social determinants of health. And so as chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, we took this opportunity um, of the pandemic, unfortunate opportunity of the pandemic to say, how can we really address the systemic barriers to health equity, the systemic barriers and crossroads or overlapping issues that um, just compound the health opportunities for black and brown communities um, and, you know, and look at why we always had the highest numbers for mm -hmm. uh, diabetes, the highest numbers for heart disease, the highest numbers for all of these other issues. Why weren't we involved and engaged in research and studies that could impact and benefit our health? And so um, with that being said, we were happy to introduce the legislation to codify the Office of Health Equity. We hope mm -hmm. we can do that before the end of this administration so that it can be there um, for future administrations. Um, hopefully the next governor, whether or not we pass this bill, would support that effort and keep this particular office in um, in, in the Department of Health. But what we have done with the, uh, with the mm -hmm. Black Caucus and the legislation I've worked on, uh, we focused on um, this month, we introduced a bill again to uh, recognize National Minority Health Month. We've been working on a resolution to um, encourage 
uh, more research for sickle cell that Rep. Kinsey has joined me on that effort. Mm -hmm. We have talked about, uh, and as you know, uh, about the environmental justice um, crossover in the intersection with our public health, um, talked about lead testing in our communities and lead poisoning um, among our children. Pennsylvania ranks six uh, when it comes to the highest percentage rate of children suffering wow. from lead poisoning. And I talked about this early on in my um, service as around the same year that I got elected, uh, my youngest son tested positive or tested to have high levels of lead in his blood at that time. Mm. And, and it became really important to me to understand the impact of lead uh, in our communities, our old housing structure and uh, the, the beautiful housing we have in our Commonwealth, but it is old and it has yeah. the potential to make our children sick. Um, the schools that we've heard public stories and how our children were being exposed to lead and asbestos in our schools. Um, and so we have legislation that one of my colleagues introduced, Representative Isaacson, to um, to mandate that you know we increase testing for our children. Um, while we have the sixth highest percentage rate, not every child is tested. In fact, only about 30% of our children are even tested for lead poisoning. And so who are we missing in those numbers? Yeah. Um, my colleague and sister rep, rep, representative uh, Morgan Cephas has been working diligently on black maternal health and wellness. And we've just closed out black maternal health week. And she has done uh, magnificent work to expand access to Medicaid and, and other resources for those um, who are using doulas or need uh, additional res re, uh, resources um, worked with our first lady to make sure that those who are um, incarcerated women who are incarcerated have the resources they need and that they're receiving the kind of maternal health and wellness care that they need to um, be healthy and lastly I'll, I'll say this we look again at all of the different social determinants of health you know, we talked about housing, we can talk about environmental issues, we can talk right. about um, employment and access, we can talk about the disparities in testing and vaccines and, and research and studies. Um, one of the other intersections around our public health is gun violence and how that impacts the health of our communities and recognizing gun violence as a public health issue has been a priority for the Black Caucus for several years. Um, and we continue to work with the administration and with other entities to to uh, put that issue front and center as our communities um, continue to be, um, you know, continue to to just deal with the onslaught of gun violence and right. of gun violence um, in our neighborhoods. And so that's been really important to us. And I can talk perhaps a little bit longer, but really the, the, the issue is that there are so many ways in which our community is impacted by health our right. public health and all of the other social determinants that um can I, our health can i ask you real quick uh represent before we let you go uh there's another bill i know that's uh at last we checked i don't know it's still in committee the Healthcare facilities act and you know the whole purpose of that bill is to uh, encourage hospital patient protection what does that stem from what really what issue or problem are you tackling there right so that bill is focused on uh nurse patient ratios we okay. want to make sure that uh, and, and that there are enough nurses for each patient, and that um, that the work of those nurses, the care that they provide, is critical to patient safety. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know that you know they are so important part of the personnel in our hospitals, in our you know medical centers, and our doctors offices. And we want to make sure that they have the right ratios. They're not overworked, particularly not after a pandemic. Um, so that is about person speaking, nurse, speaking nurse with, ratios. Speaking of what, something else I did want to ask you and other uh, representatives about uh, during pandemic, uh, did we see like, or have we monitored high incidents of uh, medical racism? And I, I, I go back to our reference. I always hear this from a uh, University of Pennsylvania lecturer, Kevin Amai Jenkins, where he says that, you know, like um, we have about 275 black people a day on some level are dying from medical racism. I mean, is that something that's a problem? That we need to look more uh, deeply into in Pennsylvania. Uh, I believe so. You know, I don't know all the numbers, but it, I think it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. And I just read an article mm -hmm. about uh, nurses, in fact, who have experienced racism on the job from yeah. their colleagues and their peers, but also from patients who don't want to be seen by the, that black nurse or that black doctor, um, mm -hmm. and even the experiences that our health professionals 
um, have. So we need to look at, you know, both medical racism when it comes to the care mm -hmm. of our um, of individuals, but exactly. also the profession and medical profession. We want to make sure we have a diverse uh, medical profession that can that is culturally, linguistically, and otherwise sensitive to the diversity of the patients that they're seeing, and it's important. So to address one, the medical, med medical racism that patients see, we need mm -hmm. to address the medical racism that's in the institution of medicine and, and making sure we get diverse doctors mm -hmm. and health and mental health professionals and nurses and others so that they can provide that, that culturally sensitive and aware care. That's right. Uh, we've been talking with State Representative Donna Bullock, uh, and she represents the 195th Legislative District, parts of Philly, uh, in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Go to pahouse.com slash Bullock for more information there. Thank you, Representative. Always good talking you. with you. All right. Um, we're going to go to her. And thanks once again, everyone who's listening and who's watching us here for our uh, Black Pennsylvania Black Health Matters Conference State of Health Policy. So we're talking about health policy today uh recent trends recent initiatives uh pieces of legislation that people are working on uh in the state of Pennsylvania, in the commonwealth of pennsylvania uh, thank you for joining us here once again uh you want to go to blackhealthmatterspa.org for more information on this pennsylvania black health matters conference here in 2022 okay let's go on to uh representative bullock's other rep uh, colleague uh, also in the pennsylvania house stephen kinsey for more information on him, you want to go to pahouse.com slash Kenzie. Representative, how are you doing today? Thanks so much for your time. Hey, Brother Ellis. Good to see you also, man. All right. Good to see you as well. So what are you working on right now? I know you got a lot. I'm sure you're, you're already uh, interacting or, or collaborating with Representative Bullock and other members of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, one of the largest uh, Black Caucus uh, collaborators in the country. Uh, so what are you working on now? I know there's uh, one particular bill you're working on, HB 162, which is to prohibit discrimination in certain insurance policies based on certain drugs. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. And, and, and again, thanks for having me. And, you know, that's actually a bill that was um, introduced by our former colleague, in fact, um, Representative Margo Davis. So, mm. And, um, you know, we now have um, Representative Curry who sits in that seat. So, right. you know, we're glad to have Sister Curry there who who really has um, jumped in and has not missed a beat since being there. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, Charles, you know, I've had the, the, the honor to serve as the subcommittee chair. I was appointed by Chairwoman Bullock as the subcommittee chair of um, health inequities for the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and just as you talked a bit earlier with, with Chairwoman Bullock, there are quite a few what we deem to be inequities all across the state of the commonwealth and you know health is just one portion of it but what i've attempted to tie in was the economics as well as the health care and what i'm talking about more specifically yeah. is that um about four years ago approximately four years ago um the state rolled out community health choices and under community health choices what that means is those individuals who 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 receive medicaid they are now, they are eligible to enroll with one of the MCOs. And there's three MCOs that were chosen by the state, um, AmeriHealth Caritas, mm -hmm. we have uh, PA Health and Wellness and UPMC. Um, so these are three, MCO, three MCOs that cover the whole Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. and, and then what we found out layered under that is that you have these home health care providers, providers who provide direct services and supports to over I said approximately 500,000 individuals across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And when I talked earlier about the, the economics and the healthcare, I'm talking about the business side of it. And, right. you know, when I came in 10 years ago under a different administration, one of the things that we found out was that um, minority, minority owned companies, and I'm saying minority owned, but I mean, I can be, be even more specific and talk about black owned companies. Um, were receiving like less than 2% of the state contracts. And we're talking about the state being, and, and this is from my perspective, we're talking about the state at that time being, well, about a $36 billion industry. Now we're about a $43 billion industry, but again, billion dollar industry period. And we found out that minority companies, especially black owned companies had less than 2% of, uh, of the contracts with the state. Um, you know, moving fast, moving ahead to where we are today. I think that we're um, somewhere in the double digits, low double digits, but but definitely there's been some progress under this current administration where we have black owned companies who now have contracts 
either directly or indirectly with with state agencies or with major contractors who have um, contracts with the state themselves. And so as it relates to this this home health care industry, we're talking about health care, a yeah. billion dollar industry. And again, over approximately 500,000 folks in the, state, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania who receive some type of home health care services. So, you know, what, what I've been focusing on um, in my role as subcommittee chair with the Black Caucus is trying to ensure that these home health care companies, especially the black owned health, home health care companies, have access to sit at the table, to have dialogue with the with the administration, to have dialogue directly with the three MCOs that I've that I've mentioned earlier. And so under the direction of Chairwoman Bullock, every single month we rotate a meeting and we bring approximately 15 to 20 black owned home health care companies to the table via Zoom. Um, in January we had a conversation with the Secretary of Department of Human Services and her staff. We talked about uh, policies that the state is looking to roll out, especially you know with the oncoming of the new budget um, that's due out July uh, July of this year. Right. Um, then in February we we, we rolled over and met with um, administration um, ad administration from um, AmeriHealth Caritas. Um, then March, um, it was. In fact, we pushed it back. In fact, tomorrow we're meeting with um, P Health and Wellness, and then next month we'll be meeting with UPMC. But what this allows, Charles, is that you know these these minority black-owned companies who many times felt as though they had no voice at all mm -hmm. now have a voice to talk directly with these companies that they have the contract with. But in, more importantly, they have the support of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus sitting at the right. table with them. And in addition to that, we have a pledge from the Secretary of the Secretary of Department of Human Services to ensure that this conversation continues and rotates on a monthly basis. And what this allows is, when I go back to the the economics of it, is it, it allows to ensure that these black companies who are doing great, providing great services, are mm -hmm. simply not being penalized simply because of the fact that they're black. It mm -hmm. allows to ensure that they have conversations. Uh, supported by the Black Caucus to talk about issues that they might be experiencing themselves or that their clients might be experiencing. But we have a robust conversation to see what we can do in a collective and not point fingers as to why someone's not getting the services that they so sorely uh, need and deserve. So I'm happy to say that, you know, this has been going on for over two years now, approximately two years. And um, again, we're continuing this dialogue. And as I mentioned, tomorrow morning at 930, you know, we have approximately 20, 20 to 25 black owned home health care companies that will be sitting at the table talking about issues, concerns, and what's ahead um, with PA Health and Wellness. Yeah, yeah. No, so, you know, I, I did want to ask you, uh, Representative, uh, so we're assuming black owned health care or black owned, black owned home health care companies are also good. I mean, this is good in terms of the economics, but are also good in terms of improving black health outcomes, right? You know, so it's, you know, the more, because that, I mean, that's part of that piece of like who you trust or who in your community you're familiar with or, you know, and, and we always have that uh, that trust gap when we're talking about the relationship between black communities, particularly in distressed states like Pennsylvania, especially in places like Philly and um, and, and larger medical institutions. So these also these black home health care providers are also uh, also filling a huge void or gap there, you know, when it comes to trust. Yeah, there's no doubt about that, Charles. It's you know, it takes me back to when um when COVID first initially rolled out, and and, right. and I'll just share this story very quickly. Um, you know, here in the city of Philadelphia, the mayor was talking about super sites, setting up super mm -hmm. sites like at the stadiums and so forth on. And, you know, I represent portions of the Northwest section of Philadelphia. Right. And, you know, a lot of my seniors, they don't drive and they were fearful to get on, on public transportation, drive to a super site. So we worked with elected officials, hospitals, local hospitals and grassroots organizations Rite Aid, Chestnut Hill Hospital, Einstein, Oak Street Health. And we made sure that those services were delivered right here in, the, in our community, right at places that these folks were familiar with. They trusted, you know, they go to Rite Aid, they get the prescriptions done. Einstein is right up the street. It's a major hospital to serve folks. Same with Chestnut Hill Hospital. So you're mm -hmm. absolutely correct. Folks felt comfortable staying in their community. Folks feel comfortable when they see someone who looks somewhat like them, that knows their community. They're not from someplace out of town. But folks who know the issues that the folks here in Philadelphia, especially the Northwest, are dealing with, so it That's made right. it much more it made it much more comfortable. And the same thing applies with these home health care companies. They're serving communities in which they they're they're stationed out of. 
Yeah, that's very important. Uh, thanks so much. We've been talking with uh, State Representative Stephen Kenzie. Go to pahouse.com slash Kenzie for more on him and see what he's working on as well, particularly on this issue um, of expanded health care access and uh, expanded opportunities uh, for black uh, for black home health care agents, uh, organizations, businesses. Uh, so we'll continue to keep in track, keep track of that issue and keep in touch with him. Now joining us is Pennsylvania State Representative Carol Hill. Uh, so we're transitioning from Philadelphia area state representatives uh, to, um, you know, a little bit further out uh, as we're going a little bit uh, further, a little bit further uh, west. We're going to York County um, State Representative Carol Hill. I'm not sure. Is she Is she there? I'm not certain if we do have her or not. Um, state Representative Carol Hill. Uh, represents the 95th legislative district. Uh, that's parts of York County. Yeah, she's she's not here uh, this she's evening. Here. She couldn't make it this evening. Yeah, okay. She's a little under no, the no. Oh, no, no worries at all. We hope she feels better. Uh, do we have Representative uh, Gina Curry? Yes, we do. All right, State Representative Gina Curry, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. All right, excellent, excellent. Good to see you. So, uh, State Representative Gina Curry represents uh, the 164th district legislative district in the commonwealth of pennsylvania uh that's uh parts of delaware county neighboring to uh to philadelphia uh, neighbors philadelphia county um and you can go to pahouse.com slash curry for more information there good to talk with you representative and uh so what are you working on in terms of okay so we went we, we talked about like the importance of community health centers and we went to p uh pennsylvania legislative black caucus chair uh donna bullock uh you know talk about the office of health equity codifying that uh, and other major issues um, in the health land on the health landscape as well. Steve Kenzie talking about black home health care organizing black owned home health care agencies and organizations providing that. What are you working on currently uh, that's improved that's 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 improving health access uh, that's also enhancing health equity in Pennsylvania right now? Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you, Charles, for having uh, me on. I am the newest member in the House. I've been mm -hmm. in a little over 100 days. Um, mm. And so I am currently working on an issue um, within my district in Delaware County that um, surrounds maternity health deserts. Um, I have a policy hearing coming up on May 11th. Um, addressing the fact that in Delaware County, um, you can't even have a baby in my particular um, district. You have to go all the way up 95 to get to Chester Crozier Hospital to have a baby now. They, yeah. Right when I came in, I think it was the end of January, they closed the maternity ward um, um, center over at DCMH, which is Delaware County um, Community Hospital. And they um, now the Chester Crozier system is in a lot of trouble um, with providing services to um, folks within my district, um, not only for maternal health, but also they've closed down operating the operating room or about to the ICU. Yeah. And so there's a lot of issues with health um, right in my area. I know, you know, I said this jokingly, but I don't want me or anybody else that is in our district to have a car accident because they might need help that they can't get to right away. Um, there's nothing really around us um, that's providing the type of service right in my particular space. There's Mercy Health, um, which is Trinity now, down mm -hmm. the street a ways. And then, like I said, over um, in Chester. Mm -hmm. I, you know, as far as, you know, black maternal health uh, nationwide problem, uh, I know in neighboring Philadelphia County, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure about what the actual data is for Delaware County, but I'm, I'm assuming that it's somewhat similar. But 75% uh, of all pregnancy related deaths involve black women. And that's in Philadelphia. So three quarters, like the vast majority of women who are dying uh, at birth or giving birth um are black women so is it the same in delaware county is that bad we in delaware have county similar data yeah we have similar data the fact of the matter is that um women black women and women of color are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth and um what we're having now in delaware county which is this huge concern as yeah. i did get off the phone 
with um, a provider here in Delaware County that had to shut their doors that provided doula care, which is pre-care, prenatal care for families. And also the post is the fact that um, we may not be able to get um, the care for these women. And you think about it, if they have to go out into um, other areas, my biggest concern right now is the implicit bias. Are these other um, uh, care facilities able to um, understand the women that are coming through their doors that are coming from other communities? And so um, these are some of the major concerns that um, I have right now in dealing with the MCOs. The MCOs, as, as Rep. Kinsey talked about clearly, um, say that they wanna be in the space taking care of black um, issues, black health issues. But really what we're seeing is, and particularly in what I'm dealing with right now, is we wanna see the support um, that comes with that. So if you yeah. have a black um, owner of a, of a, of a health care um, company, we want to see the support right and right now with this particular issue that's happening in my space in my district we're not seeing that support it should be support that comes so readily to say wow here are issues that are in the black community and we have a black owned um care company along with a female black owned care company with maternal issues um that should be getting the support like no other and right now we're not really seeing that and also i just want to bring up the fact that racial bias in the healthcare system is a space that is deadly and the yeah. reason why i say that is it's deadly because we can't afford to have implicit biases as rep bullock talked about the fact that it goes both ways some people don't want to see a nurse that's black be in their room or a doctor when that's the availability but I'm gonna take it back the other way and say, we don't have the accessibility often to get that type of care. I have a very close situation to me during COVID where we weren't getting phone calls back. Um, nobody was checking up on us. And um, this particular person that's very close to me had a very severe issue that I often wondered if we weren't the ones pushing, would that person have been a survivor at all during that right. time. It didn't have anything to do with COVID. It had to do with another heart, um, another issue, which is heart disease, which kills black people at high alarming rates. Right. And so, you know, these are some of the things that we have to look at in terms of implicit bias, racism, and the things that we just can't stand for when it comes to our health. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've been talking with state representative Gina curry uh and she's uh representing parts of delaware county go to pahouse.com slash curry do i have that correct pahouse.com slash curry uh for more information on her joining us here on uh our black health matters conference 2022 our state of health policy forum thanks so much uh represent really you. appreciate you and there's some conversation that's occurring in the chat right now uh about black maternal health uh state representative donna bullock uh, saying that black maternal health is an issue across the commonwealth pittsburgh may be the highest so you know we we're just talking about philadelphia a moment ago in the black maternal health data out of black uh maternal morbidity data out of philadelphia um not too familiar with pittsburgh but um i know state representative donna bullock is and especially uh, talking with her her colleagues out there but pittsburgh may be the highest so it's uh it's crisscrossing the state that's a real serious problem uh, that we have to keep an eye on among other issues within the uh, but that's to me uh, that's that's of the highest priority because we just don't exist without black moms without black maternal health we need black maternal health so we can exist as a black community that just is common sense to me so that's something that we have to continue to talk about thanks so much uh, we're going to transition the conversation to uh the public sector the nonprofit organizational leaders who are um, involved in health access, health equity issues across the state, across the Commonwealth. Uh, they're taking all sorts of steps to improve health outcomes in Pennsylvania, um, in the Black community, uh, especially in particular. Um, and they do a lot of collaboration with some of the policymakers that we just talked to just now. I'm going to start with Clay Jacobs, uh, if he is there. Is Clay Jacobs? I am. Evening, Charles. The Executive Director of the Alzheimer's Association. Clay, how are you doing? Good to see you. 
I'm good. It's good to see you as well. Thanks for having me. All right. Excellent. Excellent. So talk about Alzheimer's. So we don't often talk about, especially we've been in the grips of COVID. So it seems to be an issue that's taken the back burner. But um, I, I don't know. I think it may present itself uh, a lot more. Uh, it, it, it may become a lot more prominent of an issue because we're talking about all sorts of neurological disorders that are associated with COVID and long COVID. So talk about why Alzheimer's is still important, how important it is, and, and many of the challenges that uh, Black communities face being disproportionately hit by it. Absolutely. And thank you, Charles, and, and for the representatives for their comments as well. And and I do actually have to pause too, I just to congratulate Dr. Johnson, who spoke earlier, um, because just a short time ago, she was also named the Acting Secretary of Health for Pennsylvania. Mm. Uh, and as folks would likely know from our comments earlier, Pennsylvanians have a true advocate in Dr. Johnson. I'm excited to work with her on this. But for my comments, to your point, I was asked to speak about Alzheimer's disease, the Black community, and why it's such an important health topic. And it'd be easy to toss some statistics out there. But often, we don't think of Alzheimer's disease and dementia as a urgent health issue. And so it's challenging without context, because we think of it often as a regular part of aging, which it isn't. So I thought it might be worthwhile to just touch on what makes something a public health crisis and why and how that really impacts our community. When we think of this public health world, right, a crisis means that the burden is large. And we know that's true. Black Americans are twice as likely as older whites to have Alzheimer's or another dementia. Mm. And 65% of black Pennsylvanians say that they know someone with Alzheimer's disease. The second component is the impact has to be major. Much of what you've already heard tonight is particularly relevant to those with Alzheimer's disease. And 80% of black Americans say that they have barriers to excellent health care and support for Alzheimer's disease or other dimensions with half of them experiencing discrimination, specifically when seeking care for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease. And that's even more distressing when just about half as well say that for their older relatives and older families of choice, they have difficulties accessing culturally sensitive and aware care. The difference as we talk about public health versus just a regular piece of aging is that there are ways to intervene. And we're on the cusp of changing how we intervene in Alzheimer's disease and dementia. The first FDA treatment was approved. We referenced COVID, but just last year, the first FDA yeah. approved treatment for Alzheimer's happened. And we expect as many as two more likely within the next year. Even how we detect using things like blood and other biomarkers changing and the evidence base developing on how we can best protect our brains and support risk reduction. But despite that, over 50% of blacks believe the cure for Alzheimer's disease will not be distributed fairly without regard to race, color, ethnicity and access to services we've heard already is, is a significant issue. That's not even to start with the fact that uh, services lag behind our white counterparts, places like clinical trials don't uh, enroll patient populations that are truly representative of their communities. And so we think about that, all of those things, a large burden, major impact, ways to intervene. Alzheimer's disease is a true public health issue. And it's one that clearly disproportionately impacts Black Pennsylvanians. And so what do we do from a policy perspective? And I would say with Alzheimer's disease, it's a case of needing to change both uh, public policy and private policy. There's so much that it's hard to capture in our time, but it changes how we go about that work, right? From a change private policy, all the things we've lifted up before uh, in tonight's conversation around working with health systems and qual federally qualified health centers, hospitals and others to change policy and improve cultural competency through efforts like those lifted up uh, through the discussion of the Office of Health Equity. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, in Pennsylvania, something called Act 9 of 2022 just passed that starts to do just that, requiring the Department of Health to do outreach to providers and the general public around Alzheimer's disease, provide tools and to ensure that they are culturally sensitive and aware so that when folks do seek out a diagnosis, they do it in, in the most helpful and appropriate way. We also see things like research, right? The Barian research requires the same things we talked about earlier. Researchers who look like us and, and know communities and ensure that their studies are representative of those that they serve. And so mm -hmm. how do we help recruit and develop career pathing? And you know, as a private example, places like the Alzheimer's Association working with the Thurgood Marshall Scholarship Fund to make that a possibility for folks. And as we look at all of this, even in this brief moment, Right? These seem like complex problems. They're intertwined with healthcare, health and healthcare disparities, and they do require large solutions that take time. 
but not as long as people think, if they get the attention and support they deserve. And I think that's really core to tonight's theme of disrupt and build up. So as an example, uh, just as I I close, right, there's a state Mm -hmm. plan on Alzheimer's disease that sits within the Department of Aging. uh, And each year since 2018, the Department of Aging and the Alzheimer's disease state task force strive to identify one of those recommendations and move it forward. And for two years, the focus has been around increasing early detection and diagnosis amongst physicians and the general public. And yet it took something like Act 9 to see substantive movement. And so while these efforts have been laudable, they've been slow moving by lack of resources to support meaningful work and efforts are falling short of addressing this in all communities, particularly the black community. So we're actually working on legislation we we will introduce here shortly that would accelerate this progress by enhancing the Department of Health's ability, by specifically creating a Alzheimer's disease and related disorders division, establishing an advisory committee, both within the Department of Health, and then having them focus on the already in place state plan implementation, coordinating across state agencies, across great efforts like we've heard about already tonight, advocating, advocating for policy and securing funding all to better respond to the unique needs of all the communities in Pennsylvania. And so the issues are great, but the solutions are possible. And I think as we think of care and the impact of COVID and healthcare disparities, there is no time like the present to truly as a commonwealth address Alzheimer's disease. Right, right. When we talk about Alzheimer's disease disease, real quick, uh, uh, Clay, um, what are we talking about in terms of economic impact uh, or the economic hit on a commonwealth on a state like Pennsylvania, like how yeah, severe yeah. is that? Like, what's the business case for like you know putting more dollars, more resources, resources into research and uh, and prevention for this? That's a it's such a great question. Just a few years ago, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, identified Alzheimer's disease as the most expensive disease in America, mm. and that ring true mm. in, in through That's in Pennsylvania. And so, right. well, there's certainly different ways we can go at it. Just looking at unpaid care right? Families and friends providing care. The impact is in the billions and the impact to Medicare and Medicaid is similarly in the billions today. And yet just from 2020 to 2025, we expect those with Alzheimer's disease to increase by almost 15% in the Commonwealth. So quite frankly, whenever we talk about any number that that begins with an M or a B, we start talking millions and billions. That's today. It's just unsustainable as we look ahead. And that's just a drop in the bucket for those who, who've experienced this disease. Mm-hmm. The personal financial cost, the emotional cost, the physical cost, uh, it is truly devastating. Yeah, it really is. Um, we're talking with Clay Jacobs, Executive Director of the Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's Association, excuse me. Uh, you can go to alz.org, if I'm not mistaken, for more information on their work, uh, see what Clay is up to, what he's been talking about here. Uh, during the State of Health Policy Forum for Black Health Matters PA 2022 conference. Thanks so much, Clay. Good talking to you. So uh, keep up that work and we'll sh- I'm sure to follow up with you um, at some point soon. Uh, Corinne O'Connell uh, is the Executive Director, President, CEO, excuse me, of Habitat for Humanity Philadelphia. So um, I'm always talking to uh, Corinne about this topic of housing uh, and housing has a lot to do with health especially as, um, you know, we were talking earlier, I think it was uh, Representative Bullock was saying how we've got some great housing stock in Pennsylvania. It's very old. Uh, Mm -hmm. And not only is it very old, but a lot of the housing stock is very unhealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, And it's causing a lot of our health problems that we're faced with in a state like Pennsylvania, and especially in places like Philadelphia to this day. Corinne, how are you doing? I'm great. It's good to be with you, Charles, and everyone else. Thank you for having me. All right, excellent, excellent. So yeah, talk about that with you at Habitat for Humanity. Philadelphia do. I'm very familiar with it. Um, it's a great model, but um, what does that have to do with health? You explain it. What does housing have to do with health? So, um, you know, thank you to all of our elected officials here this evening. It's a long day for you all, <laughs> but thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing um, in Harrisburg. So all of the challenges um, being discussed this evening that face uh, the African American community, health, education, job, climate, all of them we can trace to housing as that foundational building block. So let's take, let's stay in the space of health, right? That's why we're here this evening. Um, Housing is medicine. Right now um, in Philadelphia, um, there's two new partnerships that we're working on, uh, one with Children's Hospital and the other with Jefferson. 
and they are both looking at taking hospital and health care out of the hospital, out of the ER and into the community. So on the CHOP side of things, we have a partnership where, um, you know, the smarter, bottom line, healthier mm -hmm. from a kiddo, from a family perspective, when a kid comes into the ER and is a sort of frequent flyer with asthma, um, the doctor writes a script for the uh, guardian to call Habitat. Right, we go in and make the repairs and the improvements to that home so that, right, the triggers, the causes of that asthma are remediated. Um, and so then CHOP is also working with Habitat because we recognize that it's not just one home, right? It's in that block and where that child walks to go to school or what have you. So Habitat then is, you know, we're working on that one house where the kiddo has asthma, but then what are the other neighborhood needs? What are the other homes needs on that block, roofs, exterior work, what have you? Um, so that's the, the CHOP initiative. Again, recognizing that home, it's where we get our start. Home mm -hmm. housing is medicine. Um, you know, in the last two years, how many times or even just now that Philadelphia had said put masks back on as, as numbers right. start to tick up. But, you know, kiddos sent to learn from home. Home has been the classroom. Right. Home has been, um, well, let me tell you about Jefferson. And then I want to get a little bit into the space of um, mm -hmm. violence and, you know, how housing stock reduces um, crime. Right. But on the Jefferson side of things, um, Jefferson has looked at the Venn diagram of zip codes, um, chronic health conditions, diabetes, heart. Um, and again, we can overlap. I'm, I know I, I am far from expert, but recognizing redlining where there's health disparities, that all of that is compiling and it is not just a fluke that that sits in the African-American community. That didn't ha that is not happenstance, that is intentional and that's legacy of racism. So Jefferson is looking at, okay, how to, again, create healthier individuals, thriving individuals. And so we're partnered with Jefferson um, in uh, certain zip codes in Philadelphia, for example, lower north central mm -hmm. where community health workers which i forget which i apologize which representative was talking about community health workers might have even been the physician general for the state um, but the community health workers are helping to identify here's someone who owns who has lived in this home on this block in this neighborhood forever um, habitat goes in and we're fixing rooms water kitchens bathrooms it is one more cost effective to to repair the existing housing stock in the state of Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. We are never going to build our way out of it in new homes. So it's the most cost effective. But the flip is, um, you know, we see the uptick in there's the both the health side of it. So engagement or more engagement with the community health worker, with the primary care physician. But then there are those other softer um, things in that, you know, I can share an example. We fixed a kitchen when we put in the stove, uh, the woman who had lived there forever and had been cooking on a hot plate, you know, she said to our team, I can go back to church. And that's an odd response, I think, or it catches your attention of like, well, that's weird. She's going to go back to church. She got an oven, but that's because she loves to bake and she loves to participate in the bake sales. And her kitchen because the roof had leaked and leaked through the second floor and leaked right through the kitchen she just kept shutting the door she was living in the living room and cooking on a hot plate so the repairs to her home the physical you know structure of her home sound and safe again she's engaged them with a community health worker and then that third piece her world opens again she goes back to church she's back engaged so all of that and clay right you could speak to you know in the space of aging adults, one of the key pieces, right, is engagement, is socialization. We are human creatures. Mm -hmm. So here's this woman who had been so isolated in her home, again, is now healthier, safer, emotionally more engaged and, and connected to her fellow church members. Mm -hmm. So housing is medicine. That's right. Um, the other two that I would mention in here, um, there was a study done um, by the University of Pennsylvania um, and published, it was probably a year ago, summertime yeah, a year ago. Yeah, last year I've been talking about a lot about this yep. study, yeah. 
um so this crime is my, going my, my anti -viol my anti-violence yes. strategy there's a citywide anti-violence strategy in philadelphia that yes. um, city leaders could be implementing right now that could reduce violence by like 77 percent almost Preach. immediately and talk about this housing this housing strategy is one of those elements but go ahead corinne yes so the uh pen study showed that repairing just one home on a block mm -hmm. crime went down 22 percent yep so in philadelphia right now there's 121,000 owner occupied homes that need repairs that's right so there's someone living there there's someone in that home let's repair the existing housing stock for all of the reasons we have just talked about on top of it is a it is a public health it is a crime reduction program the data is there um so again i think it it uh requires leaders it it, it is going to require the will of all that's right but one that is a different approach when we think about reducing gun violence that's right that's right and it's all you know just attributed to the spaces the the quality uh the health of the spaces the condition of the spaces we live in it's as simple Correct. as that that's just the most important thing uh so oh go ahead you went one last I, there's just one other that i'm gonna plug there's one other that i'll plug in here as we're talking about it so mm -hmm. uh representative state rep um nikhil saval has introduced a piece of legislation called the whole home repairs act that's right and it would be statewide and it's in the space of a grant for home repairs and so that is going to that is an important piece of legislation that is working its way through mm -hmm. um, but is one that could be game changer statewide um, mm -hmm. and the, just looking at that data there's statewide 280,000 homes that need repairs um, so if we think about it in this context of housing is medicine housing is equity housing is crime reduction housing is opportunity uh, this is an important piece of legislation working its way through in Harrisburg that's right. Uh, that's a big deal. It could be the first of its kind uh, if passed in the law in the nation. So it uh, yes. could be a model for other states to adopt as well. We've been talking with Corinne O'Connell, Habitat for Humanity, Philadelphia. Um, and for more information on them, you can go to HabitatPhiladelphia.org. Thanks again, Corinne. Pre appreciate, appreciate your time. Appreciate the time. All right. Take care. Uh, we're going to also now, we're still continuing our conversation here. Uh, during our 2022 Black Health Matters PA conference or Black Health Matters Pennsylvania, blackhealthmatterspa.org for more information. Of course, we're talking about the state of health policy in Pennsylvania. Uh, lastly, we'll go to Dr. Angela McNeil, uh, who is at Arcadia University. Uh, do we have Dr. McNeil with us? Uh, there we go, Dr. Angela McNeil. How are you doing? You are. Um, uh, we're saving some of the best for last at Arcadia <laughs> University uh, here in our state of health policy conversation. Uh, for more uh, on Arcadia University, uh, you can go to arcadia.edu. That is based in Glenside, PA, not just right outside of Philadelphia. In fact, yes. um, she's joining us here on our state of health policy conversation or forum here for Black Health Matters, PA. Good to talk with you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Charles, for having me. and. Um, it's been an honor to, to just listen to all of the representatives, the policy and procedures, mm -hmm. um, and to really just kind of culminate this conversation saying that we have been talking about, we're talking about health matters, but we've really been talking about physical health, right. um, but we need to introduce mental health into mm -hmm. this conversation. And so at the, I wanted to say that in listening to all of the previous speakers, um, we spoke about, you know, housing and, and, and lack of education um, and all of those um, health and equity, um, all of the health and equity social determinants that negatively affect the Black community um, that occurs from childhood um, through adulthood. So just think about all of those various issues um, that we've discussed, such as mm -hmm. um, access to health care and, and maternity care and so on and so forth, and enter the I retires of higher education. Um, so in higher education, um, students come in, they have to navigate the college landscape. If you're an African-American student on a predominantly 
white campus. Um, that is a, a major transition um, for you. Um, and so we know that mental health of college students um, is, is, is a major issue, uh, feelings of sadness and, and hopelessness. Um, and, and it's prevalent that many students enter college uh, with anxiety and stress, not just black students, but all students enter with a higher level of anxiety and depression, and it's more prevalent. And then of course, we've talked about COVID-19, mm -hmm. and how COVID-19 has amplified those um, stressors in the lives of students, but more particularly in African-American students um, on campuses. And so um, we want to talk about mental health in the, in the uh, African-American community in the sense that um, it's not talked about much. Um, there's a stigma attached to mental health in, in the Black community. Um, and so there are, there's a lack of access. There's a lack, there's a lack of trust in the medical establishment. Um, there's a lack of uh, culturally relevant counselors or those who, or therapists, or those who have shared experiences, lived experiences as African-Americans who seek um, help in this way. So uh, mental health is directly correlated with um, success, ac with academic success. Mm -hmm. And so black students, uh, just a few statistics, um, are 20% more likely to have serious mental health conditions. About 50% of black students report they never received any mental health education prior to college. Um, some students of color uh, report higher rates of emotional stress during their first year of college. Mm. Um, and then compared to 61% of white students, black college students report that they tend to keep their feelings about how hard college is to themselves. Yeah. So in addition to having to succeed academically, students are already are, are burdened with particular issues of stress and anxiety um, and all of the issues that we've discussed as far as um, lack of access and health inequities. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that uh, that mental health in the black community is, um, is elevated and which it has been since, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, and this racial reckoning in America, higher education has not been able to escape the scrutiny. And so we're looking and, and, and pro providing more research in those areas of how to support students in, in their mental health. At Arcadia University specifically, um, we have, in Arcadia University, we have the Anti-Black Racism Initiatives. We have uh, JEDI, Justice, Education, Diversity, and Inclusion initiatives, um, but more specifically, um, in looking at this issue of Black mental health of yeah. college students, we have hired an African-American therapist, licensed therapist. So this person is the first full-time African-American therapist at Arcadia University. Um, I also, too, uh, work in the Counseling Center, helping to um, close that gap, but just providing that access because a student, African-American students, they hold in their feelings. Um, they tend not to exert the best help-seeking behaviors. And typically in the African-American community, we, we use the you know more informal, non-traditional routes to support ourselves. So like for instance, we tend to go to our faith-based institutions for support, or yeah. we reach out to our families for support. We typically don't go to those formal supports um, that are that are set up as far as psychologists and therapists because of the lack of distrust and also the lack of knowledge uh, and the lack of access and the lack of representation. Right. Um, so we are working to reduce that at Arcadia University um, and I'm, as well as other universities on campus. Um, so we need that representation, those culturally relevant therapists Mm -hmm. um, to create um, to create a, a, a place where students feel and black students feel comfortable uh, reaching out uh, for help. 
Do uh, Dr. McNeilan, thanks for that uh, presentation uh, as well. And that you're right, uh, you're talking about the physical clinical health. Uh, don't talk enough about mental health, uh, but that's all related. And uh, the state of your mental health uh, can actually aggravate uh, or worsen your physical health um, if, if that's mm -hmm. not taken care of. I, you know, I, I, I have seen some studies in recent months and years. I, I think there was a Hope Center for College Community and Justice study that came out in January. It was like 5,000 Black students in, uh, in, in 14 different uh, public private HBCUs. I remember mm -hmm. that survey just came out. It was another study before that, but I'm just the, the name of the organization that uh, commissioned that study escapes me at the moment. But one thing that uh, is a common theme um, uh, among Black students, the struggles that they face is obviously uh, challenges with economic challenges with tuition mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. food insecurity. Food insecurity mm -hmm. was yes. uh, real big in that Hope Center study. So how much are you talking about that? How much are we talking about how to, um, you know, as, as, a, as an institution, Arcadian University, maybe other institutions about, well, how do we alleviate these other problems and stressors like, um, you know, mm. hunger? And, and a lot of black students sure. and I, we all went through it you know mm -hmm, college, mm -hmm. uh, so there we, were days of hunger and, and exactly like economic stressors like high tuition yes yeah so tuition is is a barrier right to yeah. access to higher education and so sometimes un students have to make the choice do i pay my tuition do mm -hmm. i pay housing do i yeah. buy books or do i eat right. so at many institutions there are pantries we have um, as a matter of fact, I was involved in forming the first pantry at Arcadia University, the food pantry, to address food insecurities for all students. Um, and, and so uh, that's one way in which we can help to address, but then we, of course, need to get to the root issues of, um, of just inequality um, so that we can have an equitable system so that uh, African-American students can have access, um, the same shared access, as their white counterparts um, or others who are, have these same struggles. But tuition is a barrier, which leads to maybe food insecurity. But if you're juggling all of these stressors, that's impacting negatively your mental health, which is negatively impacting your academic progress. And so we have to work on providing these resources for students in order to increase the retention and graduation rates of African-American students um, from higher educational institutions. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's going to be so important. Now, we've been talking with uh, Dr. Angela McNeil, um, and to my understanding, uh, you are the first full-time uh, Black therapist at that was hired at Arcadia University. Is that you? No, no, no. Okay. I am the Assistant Vice President for Access, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion short. and um, am representing President Nyer, who um, was I unable was... to make it. Right. That's why. But Nia Johnson, <laughs> we, I, was, I was the leading charge in hiring our first um, African-American full-time therapist um, at Arcadia University. Got it. Thank you for that. Yeah, true correction too, because when we had to make that quick transition, yes. you didn't expect to be on here uh, this evening. Um, but uh, but the president of Arcadia couldn't make it with us now. But that was okay. Uh, we had Dr. McNeil with us um, to talk about that very important issue of mental health and especially mental health that um, our young black people are going through, especially at that level, higher education level, which is a lot of stress. Um, so I'm glad that that's something that that institution is addressing, uh, among others. Thanks so much, Dr. McNeil. Really appreciate well, your time. You. This thank you. All right. Um, you know, I want to thank everyone for listening and for tuning in uh, to our uh, 2022 Black Health Matters PA conference. Once again, go to blackhealthmatterspa.org for more information. Uh, we've been talking about the state of health policy here in Pennsylvania, uh, where that is. We've been talking to a number of stakeholders, players in that health access, health equity, uh, health uh, health affairs space uh, from our state legislators to heads of organizations to many who are in the advocacy uh, realm as well. So it's a very important conversation. I want to give thanks to Black Health Matters PA and uh, to its founder, Nicole Magruder, who I'm going to actually hand the mic back to um, as we start to close this discussion. Well, first, I mean, I, I want, I, I'm thinking that we might have any questions uh, for any of our panelists who are still here. Um, or any just final thoughts or parting thoughts um, before we close this out? 
Yes. I, you know what? How about I bring everyone on screen and we can just kind of do a, a quick round robin. All right. Yeah, that would be great. All right, that's everyone. All right, excellent, <laughs> excellent. And so, you know, also, um, Dr. Johnson, congratulations to you. So I, I was just here, I remember Clay Jacobs was saying it just happened. So I wasn't aware of that, um, but you are now acting Secretary of Health for Pennsylvania, for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So congratulations to you on that. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, it, we're in a transition, so uh, I won't be acting officially until next week. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. So uh, we, we're trying to make it, I guess we made a little bit of history, you know, just that honorable mention uh, just here on this uh, state of health policy conversation, but uh, very fitting. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Very fitting. Very fitting that that happened as we were talking uh, just now. So, uh, you know, a lot to uh, talk about, you know, just real quick while we have a few more moments, um, you know, I want to go back to uh, Representative Curry, uh, as you were talking about black maternal health, I'm just real curious because I asked Clay Jacobs about the cost of Alzheimer's. I, have we given thought to the cost of black maternal health? Like what's the cost? Like, is that being talked about among state leaders about, hey, you know what? This is how much this is costing the state. Because sometimes people don't want to hear the moral or altruistic argument behind. They want to know the numbers, right? Of course, it's a moral imperative for me and for you it is as well. But in trying to persuade other state leaders that, hey, listen, this is something that we have to address. Do we have those numbers about the cost of black maternal morbidity in the state uh thanks charles i don't have the exact numbers but when i think mm -hmm. about that question i think about the outcomes in so many different ways right so you have um, black maternal health you have um, morbidity and mothers who are dying giving birth that doesn't mean that that's their first child mm -hmm. that could mean that it's their second or third mm -hmm. child leaving mm -hmm. a family without a mother um, and we have serious situations that happen all the time around it and the social determinants of health. Um, you know, I've really appreciated uh, Corinne's conversation about housing um, and housing being housing is medicine. So when we think about maternal health, um, having your mama, we know in our community is extremely important. Yeah. Um, and so losing a parent, particularly your mother, um to to um giving birth is a situation that we never want to see and i know it happened in my own family as a matter of fact my grandmother yeah. died at the age of 39 um deliver in delivery mm -hmm. so that was many years ago but that's in my legacy and it's a part of our lives that you know we may all have a piece of that and those of us who don't the legacy of that is everlasting and so you know, my grandmother, she was 39 years old, I think on her 17th child um, at that time. And, you know, the care, I think about her postpartum, I think about her care after each baby um, and, and mm. what that must have been like at that time. But yeah. this is 2022. Why are we still having those issues? <laughs> so, yeah, the, the yeah. cost, the cost in numbers, yes, is the state. We need to be paying attention to that. But the everlasting legacy of those maternal deaths um, is a legacy that that lasts forever in our black families. Yeah, yeah, no, that sounds, sounds very important. Oh, go ahead. Go, go. Yeah, if you don't mind, I, I definitely would like to weigh in. Um, I am an OBGYN physician, and so this is very near and dear to me. Mm -hmm. um, and as uh, Representative Curry said, uh, uh, the mortality is just the tip of the iceberg. So for every individual that dies, there are dozens or hundreds more who experience morbidity. And if uh, a mother experiences morbidity or mortality, that affects not only her and her immediate family and the children, but the whole community. So maternal health should be paramount for all of us because our communities depend on good maternal health. Yeah, yeah no, that's absolutely uh, important. But Nicole, I know we're. Um, I, I know you're watching the clock very closely. So, um, if, if we need to close out, no, no, you're you're good. You're good. Yeah, I, you know, I, if there was anyone else that wanted to jump in, we're okay. 
But if not, we can go ahead and close it down. Um, what I wanted to say first was I really, really want to thank everyone um, sincerely from the bottom of my heart. Um, this is the first day of the conference, and I really wanted um, us to have the, you know, the legislators that are out there at the helm. I want to have these uh, leaders from the community that are working every day that folks just don't know about these initiatives that are going on. Right. And they're so powerful and so impactful. So this conference is for the people. So we're trying to create content that's consumable and they can watch this. So some folks are watching this on the conference, mm -hmm. but we made it available to different social media platforms. So we might not know everyone that's that's watching, but it's okay as long yeah. as they're consuming it where they want to and it that's resonates right. with them in that space. So yeah. I just encourage everyone tonight who was watching, please reach out to your public uh, officials. Please reach out to these organizations, find out how you can be engaged, share your stories. There's a lot that we don't know until we know. So please be your own be your own advocate. Um, I hope that this uh, this conversation has will spark up spark up some energy out there in the community. Um, and like I said, this is just the, the first day and we will are going for another six days um, this week with a lot of topics that are germane to the to the black community. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I, I just thank you all so much for being here. This really, you know, it's, it's very, very meaningful. Yeah for the community across the PA. Um, we are recording uh, this this conversation. And I believe I said this maybe at the top of the hour that we will be uploading all of the, the, um, the sessions as we proceed through the week. So the individuals who log in later on in the week and they missed it, hey, let me click here and let me you know watch this. So it will be available for individuals to watch after today. And then at the end of the week, they will all be uploaded to our YouTube channel so folks can also discover all of this great information. Um, if you want to read more and learn more about uh, all the panelists, please be sure to go to blackhealthmatterspa.org, click on speakers, everyone's contact information is in there, um, as well as uh, their, their bios. So um, thanks again to you, Charles. Thank you to all the esteemed uh, panelists. Um, I truly, truly appreciate you. And I'm sure so does the community. Yeah, thank you, thank Nicole. You. Thanks for your efforts. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone, and have a good evening. Have a good evening. Take care. Have a good evening.